West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netrootsradio.com Jeffrey Berman was the U.S. attorney in SDNY, the federal prosecutor's office in Manhattan, while all this was happening. And Jeffrey Berman technically was recused from directly overseeing this case, um, the, the hush money case, because he had been part of the Trump campaign before he was appointed U.S. attorney. And he thought that might have seemed like a conflict of interest, given that the case involved fraud allegations about campaign expendi- expenditures. So he was technically recused from overseeing the case, but he was in charge of the U.S. Attorney's Office when this case went to court. And in his book, in this book, Holding the Line, that Jeffrey Berman published about his time as U.S. Attorney in SDNY, he explains in detail that Maine Justice under Trump reached into SDNY and intervened with the prosecutor's office in Manhattan to protect Trump in this case. He says it explicitly. This is from page 24 of Jeff Berman's book. Quote, the first time Maine Justice intervened, sorry, Uh, even though I was not overseeing the Cohen case, I still had to deal with other issues involving it, all of them deriving from the same source, Maine Justice and its attempts at interference. The first time Maine Justice interfered was when the information was being finalized. Information is a term of art in this context. After Michael Cohen agreed to plead guilty, the charging instrument against him uh, became an information rather than indictment. So that was the title of the document that Berman is referencing here. It was an information. It was about 40 pages long, he says. And it, quote, referenced a person identified as individual one as having acted in concert with Michael Cohen. He says, quote, there was zero doubt as to the identity of individual one. It was Donald J. Trump. Berman says, quote, consistent with DOJ guidelines, we first submitted the information to the public integrity section at Maine Justice. They signed off. We then sent a copy to the deputy attorney general at the time, Rod Rosenstein, informing him that Cohen's guilty plea was imminent. The next day, the prosecutor in my office who was overseeing the case received a call from Rosenstein's principal deputy. He was aggressive. Why the length, he wanted to know. He argued that now that Cohen is pleading guilty, we don't need all this description of the crime. The prosecutor responded, what exactly are you concerned about? Rosenstein's deputy deputy proceeded to identify specific allegations that he wanted removed from the information. Almost all of them were items referencing individual one, Donald J. Trump. Quote, it quickly became apparent that it wasn't the overall length or detail of the document that concerned him. It was any mention of individual one. The two men went through a handful of these allegations, some of which the prosecutor agreed to strike, others he did not. The revised document, now 21 pages, remember it had started as 40 pages, now 21 pages, kept all of the charges to which Cohen was pleading guilty, but removed certain allegations, including allegations that individual one acted in concert with and coordinated with Cohen on the illegal campaign contributions. Berman goes on to describe how Trump appointed Attorney General William Barr 
personally intervened in the hush money investigation later as well. Quote, while Cohen had pleaded guilty, our office continued to pursue investigations related to possible campaign finance violations. When Barr took over as attorney general in February 2019, six months after Cohen had pleaded guilty, Barr not only tried to kill the ongoing investigations, but incredibly suggested that Michael Cohen's conviction on campaign finance charges could be retroactively reversed. Barr summoned the prosecutor leading the hush money case in late February. So this is one of the first things Barr does when he becomes attorney general. He only only becomes attorney general in February. Before the end of that month, he summons the lead prosecutor on the hush money case to, quote, challenge the basis of Cohen's guilty plea, as well as the reasoning behind pursuing similar campaign finance charges against other individuals. The prosecutor was told to cease all investigative work on the campaign finance allegations until the Office of Legal Counsel, a part of Maine Justice, determined if there was a legal basis for the campaign finance charges to which Cohen pled guilty, and until Barr determined there was a sufficient federal interest in pursuing charges against others. The directive Barr gave the prosecutor, which was amplified that same day by a follow-up phone call, was explicit. Not a single investigative step could be taken, not a single document in our possession could be reviewed until the issue was resolved. And if Maine Justice decided there was no legal basis for the Cohen charges, the Attorney General of the United States would direct us to dismiss the guilty pleas of Michael Cohen, the man who implicated the Attorney General's boss, the President. Berman closes with this. He says, quote, I've tried not to make assumptions about the motivations of Barr or anyone else. I am a lawyer trained to deal in fact. But Barr's posture here raises obvious questions. Did he think dropping the campaign finance charges would bolster Trump's defense against impeachment charges? Was he trying to ensure that no other Trump associates or employees would be charged with making hush money payments to perhaps flip on the president? Was it part of an effort to undo the entire series of investigations and prosecutions over the past two years of those in the president's orbit? People like Michael Cohen, Roger Stone, and Michael Flynn. Berman says, quote, was the goal to ensure that the president himself could not be charged after leaving office? Jeffrey Berman then goes on to explain in his book that Barr uh, subsequently tried to take the whole hush money case out of SDNY, take it out of his office and give it to another U.S. attorney. Berman apparently successfully blocked that effort from Barr. Berman also explains that this standoff between his prosecutor's office and Maine Justice went on for months while Maine Justice explicitly barred SDNY federal prosecutors from looking at a single document or taking a single investigative step of any kind. While this one guy, Michael Cohen, is sentenced to prison. Even though that same prosecutor's office had named another person with whom Michael Cohen committed this felony. And so, no, they never charged that other person. They never charged Trump, even though they concluded and told the court that he had committed the crime with Cohen. Never charged him, never tried to charge him, never tried to charge anyone else. And then it got worse because New York Times reporters William Rashbaum and Bren Ben Protest uh, reported at the New York Times in August 2019 that in addition to effectively botching this as a federal case and federal prosecution, federal prosecutors in SDNY also blocked anyone else from pursuing this case either. I mean, making illegal campaign expenditures, whether or not you lie about it on your company books by calling it legal expenses, I mean, making illegal campaign expenditures is a crime in every state as well as a federal crime. And New York state prosecutors were therefore interested when the details of this crime became known, when, when Michael Cohen started telling Congress and telling the public what he'd been involved in, New York state prosecutors were interested in pursuing potential state charges related to this crime. But as William Rashbaum and Ben Protest reported at the New York Times, quote, the New York District Attorney's Office initially considered mounting an inquiry in 2018, but the office paused that effort at the request of federal prosecutors. So federal prosecutors get like blown up by Trump's DOJ, by Maine Justice under Trump, for even just bringing a case against Michael Cohen. They get ordered to not investigate anyone else for these crimes. They get threatened that even Cohen's going to be let go too, despite the fact that he pled guilty. Federal prosecutors at SDNY fold in the face of that pressure. 
and simultaneously they tell state prosecutors that they can't look at the case either. You can't look at this, actually. This is, uh, the, we're, the, we're the feds and we're handling this. Yeah, the feds were not handling this. <laughs> at least they were not handling this well. But while they were botching it, they were preventing other prosecutors who could have pursued it on their own terms without pressure from main justice. And that brings us to today's news, to this finally starting to clear up. For, for, for us as a country, for finally starting to get clear of the mess that President Donald Trump and Attorney General Bill Barr made of American law, particularly where it comes to public corruption. These things don't just disappear into the ether, they create precedent. They worm away at the integrity and the basic core functions of the U.S. Justice Department. And unless and until they are fixed or corrected, it just rots the system. This stuff can't be left to dangle. It has to be tied off. Even if the federal prosecutors aren't going to do it themselves, somebody's going to have to. And today, New York Times reporter William Rashbaum and his colleagues at the Times were first to report that New York state prosecutors, as of today, have started presenting evidence to a grand jury related to this case. And this time, it is not about Michael Cohen. This time, it is finally about Trump. Quote, the Manhattan District Attorney's Office today began presenting evidence to a grand jury about Donald J. Trump's role in paying hush money to a porn star during his 2016 presidential campaign, laying the groundwork for potential criminal charges against the former president. The grand jury was recently impaneled. The beginning of witness testimony today represents a clear signal that the district attorney, Alvin Bragg, is nearing a decision about whether to charge Mr. Trump. And this has been a, a weird saga. This has been an on again, off again criminal case. At core, it is a simple crime. It is a very understandable crime, one in which the evidence is really clear. And for years now, I mean, we're going on seven years since the crime, five years since people started going to prison for it. For years now, people have been doing backflips to make sure that there are no charges, no consequences for the guy who prosecutors say committed the crime and who is the only person who benefited from it. The purpose of this crime was to help Donald Trump's campaign for president. He did become president, which apparently does give you carte blanche to stay out of handcuffs for four years while you're occupying the Oval Office. But not after. <laughs> it doesn't last once you're out. Once you are out of the Oval Office, you're supposed to go back to being the kind of person who isn't allowed to get caught committing crimes without having to pay. It has taken all of these years I am happy to say that Stormy Daniels is doing fine. She's doing better than fine. But we're about to find out if we can say the same about the rule of law and the justice system, which they really royally screwed up in their time in office. It is Tuesday, the 31st of January of 2023. And you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner the English Bulldog is our snoozing sous chef. And our daily special is Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays. A small scant dash, a mere pinch of hot smoked Hungarian paprika will make all the difference in the world. You know it always has, and it always will. Okay, well, how are you? It is Tuesday as we march along to the new year. And yes, this new year is about a month into it. Yes, we are after today. Anyway, uh, we have Black History Month uh, coming up in coming up tomorrow, which apparently I, I I'm pretty sure is outlawed in Florida now. Black History Month, of course, is critical race theory, and you can't have that because it might indoctrinate the kids into knowing the actual truth about how this country was built. All right. And when I say built, I mean built on the backs of... If they were not low paid, they weren't paid at all. Jeez. Right. Can't learn about that. Might make some white kid feel bad. No, what it will do is it'll make some white kid wonder what the hell we were doing. And, well, let's try to make it better. Because once a white kid does that, you know that they are a traitor to their race. How many times have I heard that before growing up? Not in my family, by the way. No, our family had 
crosses burned on our lawn because, well, you know, <laughs> we were taught critical race theory and then we had empathy for people who, uh, well, <laughs> were enslaved. Yeah, you don't want to feel bad about that. Okay. All right. Well, that is one reason why you and I are not part of that conservative movement. Jeez. I always like the idea of conservative being like for conservation. That's what I always thought. Let's let's keep our uh let's keep nature, you know, like the way it is. Not our politics, the way our politics were at the time and at Apparently, we want to get back to it. And I say we, I mean, you know, the greater we, who happens to be about a toxic third, but they have an outsized voice now, don't they? And a lot of guns. Anyway, apparently, empathy, concern, care, <laughs> those those are anti-American traits now. All right. Well, we were told this would happen if the Nazis took over, especially with the help of a mob state like Russia. And that's what they are. A mob state run by mobsters. And now we fo- now we are finding out that uh, the tentacles of old Vlad were uh, a bit more uh, wrapped around the throat of representative democracy, at least Western representative democracy, a lot more than... Uh, well, I guess we were allowed to speculate now, weren't we? <laughs> yeah, they used to. Oh, you're just using the Russia thing as like an excuse because Hillary was a bad candidate. Why was she a bad candidate? I'm still trying to figure that out. Because there's a lot of people that just, they, they, they tell you she was a bad candidate, but they can never tell you why. Other than, well, she, you know, she was damaged so much by decades and decades of a vast right-wing conspiracy. Is it any coincidence that she sat on the council for the White House Watergate probe? Or not the White House, but the Watergate probe of the Nixon White House? Because there's a lot of the same actors, and I'm looking at you, Roger Stone, and I'll even say I'm looking at Bill Barr, too, because he was but a mere kid. Well, in relative terms. But by the time he got to work with Ronald Reagan, which wasn't that very long after Watergate, let's be clear. He had some ideas about get back now, didn't he, along with Roger Stone, along with Lee Atwater. And Manafort, they all had a shop together right after Watergate. And what was their task? Mm -hmm. Right the wrong of this liberal takeover of what they had that was working so good. Little did they know that what they were proposing and put in place would work even better. Because look where we are now. And a lot of people have made money. A lot of money out there uh, when you can tickle the lizard brain part of, you know, the, the lizard brains. The toxic third. They have an outsized voice. A lot of guns. And apparently a lot deeper pockets. We, we, we go, oh, they're just like, you know, marginal people who, who have some, like, economic anxiety. Remember that? Economic anxiety was like a nice way of saying they were unreconstructed racists. Their economic anxiety was that, uh, what, you know, I'm going to be equal to that. And we have to give them sucre. We have to reach across the aisle and shake their hand while they chop it off right at the elbow. They don't even go for the wrist. They go right to the elbow. If not all the way up to the shoulder. Hell, let's just chop them at the neck. And they do. Riding around the interstates in Taliban caravans. Remember that? Flags a waving. Economic anxiety. They had enough money to buy guns. Monster trucks. And when I say monster trucks, I'm talking about monster trucks. Jeez. They ought to be working in a quarry somewhere. Tonka toys. For. Oversized boys. 
<sighs> when I was a kid, at least the group I ran around with and the teachers I took serious pretty much uh, told us, you know, you're being programmed into thinking that your masculinity, your manhood is tied into some product you're buying. Don't fall for it. I guess other people didn't get that message. Yeah. The car I drive determines to the whole world what kind of guy I am. Give me a break. I could care less. It's a conveyance to get me from point A to point B. And I don't know, maybe we'll go all the way to Z, too, because when you're on a long trip, you can fill it up. Okay, well, apparently that kind of critical thinking is not taught anymore because it might make some white kid feel bad. No, it's not making some white kid feel bad. It's making white kids probably open up their eyes and say, what the hell did we do? Enslaving people? That's supposed to be good? No. Actually, every kid I knew, even the ones that came from racists, initially they thought the idea of owning another human being was abhorrent. Even as kids we knew that. It was only later, you know, when the idea of property... And what it takes to work that property and you have to do it yourself. You can't do that. Not for the kind of pay involved. So it's a lot better to enslave a bunch of people. Do the work. Have them do the work for you and you reap the profits. Oh, but they were happy slaves because, you know, they were they were housed and fed. Oh, yeah. Jeez. Gruel in a chicken coop. You get to live in a chicken coop. Here, have some gruel. Aren't you happy? Happy slaves. Give me a break. Okay. Well, you and I have gone through this argument long, long ago. I don't know why we have to go over it again. Jeez. American amnesia. Could that be the excuse for it? Or has it been a concerted effort by uh, some hostile foreign actors? I began to uh, speak a little bit about how how uh, entrenched Putin is in our system. And we have a few, well, we have a couple of stories, at least, that uh, reflect that concern. Another one that is reminded, that we are reminded of, is that uh, close confidant spokesperson uh, for Ron DeSantis had to uh, register as a foreign agent. Because she's working for the president of Georgia, you know, the country, Georgia, who is in cahoots with Vladimir Putin. <laughs> I mean, they're best friends, you know. Okay. Then we got this guy. I keep telling everybody this guy, uh, Santos. Uh, I think, you know, we already have documented evidence that he's aligned with at least a Russian oligarch who just, well, you know, the son or relative of a Russian oligarch who just happens to have close ties with the Kremlin. Just happens. It's all a coincidence. But I keep telling everybody that uh, it doesn't stop in Brazil with this guy. Yeah, that He might be from Brazil, but that's also where he was recruited. Let's be clear about that. And when you got the Freedom Caucus, the J6 insurgents, what else can you call them? The Marjorie Taylor Greens, the Cottons, all of them. The Hollies, every single one. Matt Getz. We need a full accounting of what's going on in Ukraine. No, what they're trying to do is give up some secrets to Vlad because they're all on the take from Vlad. And that's why our Justice Department has a bit of a problem on their hands because if they arrest the whole Republican Party, that means it's us that will be running it. And that just apparently can't happen. Because our kind of responsibility, our kind of concern for equal protection and due process for all, our concept of what it is to not only be a follower of international law, but to set the precepts of what it means for a representative democracy to set and follow international law. 
and that just cannot stand. Because apparently, according to these plantation owners, that's not what America's all about. America was built on the backs of the enslaved, and that's what made America great, so let's bring slavery back. Well, I would argue maybe slavery never left. And I'm not just talking about the prison system, and I'm not just talking about corporate interests taking over stateless corporate interests, by the way, who can pay people a pittance and say, well, <laughs> they're happy workers. They're housed and they're clothed and they're well-fed. Gruel. Rags. Living in a chicken coop. It all comes back, doesn't it? It all comes back like in a circle. Ah, such is the folly of life. Anyway, let us uh, now concern ourselves with... Uh, I had to turn around. Oh, my gosh. You know, not having the uh, counters right in front of me because I have to turn a tad. I got to fix this system so I don't have to turn so much. But anyway, we have been burning up time, and uh, that was a bit of time for Rachel to break down what the hell's going on with the Stormy Daniels hush money case. At least it's beyond Bill Barr's obstacles so far, as far as we know. On the rest of the menu here, as we begin this fine Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays in the Bistro Cafe, the Treasury Department will increase borrowing amid the debt ceiling standoff. That's going to help Joe in negotiations, isn't it? Yeah, that's really going to help. Thanks. California's Tulare County will pay $32 million in a child welfare settlement. And... A federal appeals court issued a secret hold that blocks the Justice Department from searching the phone of J6 insurgent Scott Perry. After the break, we move to the chef's table where NATO member Slovenia apprehended a husband and wife Russia spy team suspected of using an agency dealing in real estate and antiques as a front for their activities. Wow, it's like the Americans. And a Russian oligarch with close ties to Putin is standing trial in federal court in Boston over a hacking and insider trading scheme. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. Radio.com. To the right of the page is the chat room link monitored by Kelly Lincoln, and we thank Kelly for doing so. To the left across the page from that chat room link and down a notch or two at our homepage at NetRootsRadio.com is the link to our Patreon page, and you know what to do there. Uh, please become a recurring Patreon of NetRoots Radio. It would really help, so thank you. If you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, do so at Netroots Radio. Also, you can follow us on Mastodon at Netroots Radio, MSTDN Plus. Uh, you'll find us there. Uh, Tom takes care of those social media platforms, and we thank Tom for doing so. Follow me on Twitter. I'll get on Mastodon and maybe even Spoutable. He's uh, opening it up now, just letting everybody know. But uh, anyway, follow me on Twitter at Justice Putnam. I incidentally post the show notes and links diary on Daily Co's 10 minutes before showtime. That's where you can find the full articles from uh, where I have derived this, well, the, uh, the, the curated part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. You can find them in the show notes and links. 
on Daily Kos. So do follow the show on Twitter at Cookbook West. Pick up podcasts by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes. Did I say tune in everywhere? Wherever you can find podcasts, iTunes, everywhere. They're <laughs> everywhere. Find them, please. All right. This first offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasies, Terrytown Chatter Tuesdays, is out of the Associated Press by Fatima Hussein. The Treasury Department said yesterday, Monday, it plans to increase its borrowing during the first three months of 2023, even as the federal government is bumping up against a $31.4 trillion limit on its legal borrowing authority. The U.S. plans to borrow $932 billion during the January to March quarter. That's $353 billion more than projected last October due to a lower beginning of quarter cash balance and projections of lower than expected income tax receipts and higher spending. The increased borrowing will take place as Democrats and the White House push for Congress to increase the federal debt limit. President Joe Biden wants the cap raised without any preconditions. The new House Republican majority is seeking to secure spending cuts in exchange for a debt limit increase. And when they say spending, they mean Medicare, Social Security, the safety net. They're not going to increase taxes to get those receipts that are expected to be lower, which is already very low in this reporter's opinion. Treasury officials say the debate over the debt ceiling poses a risk to the U.S. financial position. Even just the threat that the U.S. government might fail to meet its obligations may cause severe harm to the economy by eroding household and business confidence, injecting volatility into financial markets, and raising the cost of capital, among other negative impacts. Ben Harris, Treasury Assistant Secretary for Economic Policy, said in a statement, Well, I think that these people, who are mostly crooks in real life, who have a known history of being scaff laws and not paying their bills, do you really think they care about a debt limit in government? Well, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, in a letter to congressional leaders earlier this month, said the department has begun resorting to, to quote, extraordinary measures, end quote, to avoid a federal government default. She said it is critical that Congress act in a timely manner to raise or suspend the debt limit. In a letter to House and Senate leaders, Yellen said her actions will buy time until Congress can pass legislation that will either raise the nation's borrowing authority or suspend the limit for a period of time. She said it is unlikely that cash and extraordinary she says it is unlikely that cash and extraordinary measures will be exhausted before early June. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy will meet with Biden at the White House to discuss a debt limit. McCarthy told CBS's Face the Nation on Sunday, I want to sit down together and work out an agreement that we can move forward to put us on a path to balance and at the same time not put any of our debt in jeopardy at the same time. You notice how this discussion was never had the three times that Trump was able to raise a debt limit for his profligate spending in which they added how much? $7 $7 trillion to the deficit, and now they're blaming Joe for it. Associated Press staff brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. 
Central California's Tulare County will pay $32 million to settle a lawsuit alleging its child welfare agency failed to respond to reports of abuse involving an infant boy who was hospitalized for malnutrition and suffered brain damage. Under the terms of the settlement, the county must also implement policies and computer software that will enable child welfare services to better track and follow up on allegations of child abuse. Tulare County officials and its attorneys did not immediately respond yesterday Monday to requests for comment on the settlement. The deal was announced just weeks before trial was scheduled in the civil case filed last February on behalf of a child named in court papers as J.G. The lawsuit alleged child welfare services failed to investigate multiple reports starting in March of 2020, claiming that J.G. suffered neglect and abuse while in the custody of his biological parents. At 10 months old, the boy was hospitalized and suffered profound and permanent brain damage due to severe malnutrition, according to the court filing. The lawsuit accused the county, the Child Welfare Agency, and its employees of negligence. It sought unspecified monetary damages for physical, mental, emotional pain and suffering. Politico brings us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasies, Terry John Chowder Tuesdays. A federal appeals court panel has put a secret hold on the Justice Department's effort to access the phone of Representative Scott Perry as part of a broader probe of efforts by Trump and his allies to subvert the 2020 election. In a sealed order er, issued earlier this month, the three-judge panel temporarily blocked a lower court ruling that granted prosecutors access to Perry's communications. The December 28 ruling by U.S. District Court Judge Burl Howell was the product of a secret months-long legal battle by prosecutors who have been fighting the Pennsylvania Republicans' attorneys on the matter since August. The existence of the legal fight, a setback for DOJ reported here, at Politico for the first time, is itself intended to be shielded from public scrutiny, part of the strict secrecy that governs ongoing grand jury matters. The long-running clash was described to Politico by two people familiar with the proceedings. The fight has intensified in recent weeks and drawn the, and drawn the House newly led by Kevin McCarthy into the fray. On Friday, the chamber moved to intervene in the back and forth over letting DOJ access the phone of Perry, the House Freedom Caucus chair, reflecting the case's potential to result in precedent-setting rules about the extent to which lawmakers can be shielded from scrutiny in criminal investigations. The House's decision to intervene in legal cases is governed by the Bipartisan Advisory Group, a five-member panel that includes McCarthy, his Democratic counterpart Jeffries, and other members of the House leadership. The panel voted unanimously to support the House's intervention in the matter, seeking to protect the chamber's prerogatives, according to one of the two people familiar with the proceedings. After this This story was first published yesterday, Monday. McCarthy's spokesperson, Mark Bednar, acknowledged the House has stepped into the legal legal fight, uh, 
about Perry's communications. The Speaker has long said that the House should protect the prerogatives of Article 1. This action indicates new leadership is making it a priority to protect House equities, Bednar said, which I suppose is translated that if you have fomented a violent coup to overthrow the United States government, <laughs> hands off! We have our House rules! FBI agents seized Perry's phone with a court-approved warrant in August, but still lack a necessary second level of judicial permission to begin combing through the records. Perry has claimed his communications are barred from outside review because of constitutional protections afforded to members of Congress that were designed to let lawmakers better fulfill their official responsibilities. And presumably his official responsibility was being part of a violent insurrection against the United States of America. And I guess that's considered privileged communications because it's under the advise and consent clause. Give me a break. Now, Perry's Perry first challenged DOJ's authority to access his communications in a public lawsuit in August filed shortly after his phone was seized. He made the Constitution speech or debate clause prohibited the government from accessing messages he might have sent in connection with his work as a member of Congress, a member of Congress that is an insurgent party tasked with overthrowing the United States of America with violence if necessary. More than four months after the government obtained Perry's phone, Howell sided with the, with the DOJ. While Howell's rulings in the dispute remain under seal, along with any rationale that appeals court judges may have offered for their actions, some spare details about the fight appear in the court's public docket. On January 5th, according to the docket, a three-judge appeals court panel put a temporary hold on Howell's ruling. The appeals panel, assigned to the case, which includes Trump appointees Naomi Rao, and Gregory Katsis, as well as Karen Henderson, who was appointed by President George H.W. Bush, rejected prosecutors' immediate attempt to access Perry's documents. Those judges instead set out a schedule for additional legal briefing and a February 23rd oral argument at the Prettyman Federal Courthouse in Washington. I guess we'll have to follow this by looking at the court docket. All right, let us now get to our break. And when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world and we will finish up with the stories that we have curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook Speakeasy. And we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new world. This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Karen Hopkin. Climate change. It's the culprit behind an increase in droughts and floods, wildfires and storms. And a new study shows that it's making more meerkats come down with tuberculosis. The findings appear in the journal Nature Climate Change. So tuberculosis is an endemic disease in meerkats. It uh, has been present in the population since um, the meerkats have been studied. Maria Panif is a researcher at the Doniana Biological Research Station in Spain. She says that for meerkats living in the Kalahari, TB outbreaks have been on the rise. Coincidentally, so have the local temperatures. So we wanted to know whether there was a link between climate change, which you know um, has been increasing temperature extremes, and uh, increases in tuberculosis outbreaks, and how this may affect population of this uh, social species. So Panif and her colleagues crunched the numbers. I was very fortunate to collaborate with the Kalahari Mirkat project, which is a fantastic project where we now have over 22 years 
of very detailed data on individual meerkats and about their survival, their reproduction, their growth, their movement, and so on. So it's a very rich data set to work with. They use the data to build models to predict how climate change will affect meerkat populations. Our main results show that climate change affects meerkats primarily by increasing the likelihood of deadly TB outbreaks. And according to the model, it can do so in two ways. First, extremely hot years increase physiological stress on meerkats because meerkats you know, need to hide from the extreme heat. They do not have enough time to search for food. And extreme heat may also be associated with very low rainfall and therefore drought, so little food availability. That stress increases the probability that an endemic disease will turn into an outbreak that can completely wipe out meerkat populations, with the extinction risk for local groups predicted to double over the next dozen years. And the other way is that climate change also sort of destabilizes local groups and makes male meerkats much more mobile. Meerkats live in social groups, from which males normally disperse to find mates. And when it's warmer, males are much more likely to hit the road. And with that, they carry a disease, they carry tuberculosis with them. And by moving around so much, they spread disease between meerkat groups, which again um, increases the chances or the risk um, of severe outbreaks. And Panif says it's not merely meerkats that should be concerned about the climate. This finding is particularly interesting and important because tuberculosis is a very widespread disease which affects many species, including livestock that is quite important for humans. Yet another way that climate change could land us all in hot water. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Karen Hopkin. Hi, it's Tom. Could we humbly suggest your donation to NetrootsRadio.com? All we've got to run this 24-hour powerhouse of progressive resistance radio is what comes out of our own wallets. And you, you are our biggest donor. And it doesn't take much, $3, $5. Just go to the bottom of our NetrootsRadio.com page and hit our secure donate button. Heck, you can even make a recurring contribution. So donate what you'd like at the bottom of our NetrootsRadio.com's homepage. Because you are our biggest donor. NetrootsRadio.com. Together, we are Resistance Radio. An old political saying notes that the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good people to do nothing. However, given the proliferation of today's goofball culture wars and fanatical right-wing phobias, that truism should be updated to say evil swarms when power-hungry leaders unleash the crazies. Which brings us to the U.S. House of Representatives, now led by a run-of-the-mill corporate Republican Kevin McCarthy. He's always been a crassly ambitious political climber, untethered to any moral principle larger than his own ego. So he's not trusted, even by GOP lawmakers. Indeed, in an almost comical public spectacle, it took four days and 15 rounds of voting in January before Kevin could cut enough desperate deals to get the slimmest majority of his own Republican colleagues to make him Speaker of the House. To squeak out his win, though, he had to hand big chunks of his official power to a gaggle of extremist, far-right-wing legislators who are, in a word, bonkers. Marjorie Taylor Greene, Paul Gosar, and other members of the GOP's kooky caucus promote unhinged QAnon conspiracy theories, warn that Jews are firing lasers from outer space to start wildfires, lionize Vladimir Putin and Adolf Hitler, call for the execution of Democratic leaders, and insist that the government is staging school shootings as an excuse to outlaw guns. Okay, they're nuts, and politics makes strange bedfellows. But McCarthy has not just climbed into bed with them, He's snuggling up tightly, naming them to powerful committees, publicly legitimizing their screwballism, and intentionally bringing the evil of bigotry, intolerance, and even fascism in from the fringe of politics to sit in the seat of power. This is Jim Hightower saying, this is shameful, and it's dangerous. 
evil swarms when so-called leaders meekly give permission for crazies to use the government power to rule over us. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1865. That was the day the United States Congress passed the 13th Amendment to the Constitution abolishing slavery. President Abraham Lincoln had already issued the Emancipation Proclamation, but there was worry that the proclamation, an emergency wartime measure, would not stand up in the courts after the war had ended. The introduction of the amendment first occurred in 1864 as the Civil War raged on. That meant that only Northern legislators were present to debate the issue. Despite this, the amendment failed to pass the House of Representatives. Determined to ensure its passage on the second try, President Lincoln made the amendment part of the National Republican platform for the presidential election. He lobbied heavily for the bill and was able to win enough support for its passage. The New York Times described the scene after the vote in the House of Representatives, writing, No attempt was made to suppress the applause, which came from all sides. Everyone feeling that the occasion justified the fullest expression of approbation and joy. The final amendment read, Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist in the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. The amendment then had to be ratified by three-fourths of the states. The ratification marked a fundamental change in the labor system of the United States. No more would the nation be divided by free labor and slave labor laws. Kentucky did not officially ratify the 13th Amendment until 1976, and Mississippi did not follow until 1995. Like what you hear? Check out more at laborhistoryin2.com. Thank you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays. We always begin weather from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 21 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm laughing. And we're expecting high a high of around 50, so that's a bit warmer than we had yesterday. Partly to mostly cloudy, and winds will be light and variable. And mo- partly to mostly cloudy overnight, lows ar- around 30, which means it could be in the 20s. Winds light and variable, and then partly to mostly cloudy tomorrow. Highs in the low to mid 50s, winds light and variable, and we do have a forecast for rain later in the week. Pollen is rated as none outside the window here in the town of Rogue River. The air quality index for the region has notched up into the moderate range at at 54 parts per million. And that daytime UV index is low at level 1. Barometric pressure is falling at 30.31 inches. Visibility is at 9 miles. And relative humidity is at 76 percent. Weather from around the world is brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that are crowd crowdsources from around the world. London is 51 degrees and fair. Paris is 48 and cloudy. Rome is 54 and fair. Kiev is 33 degrees and cloudy. Kabul is 24 and mostly cloudy. Hong Kong is 65 and partly cloudy. Tokyo is 36 degrees and clear. Sydney, Australia is 70 and partly cloudy. San Francisco, California is 42 degrees and sunny with a wind advisory for small craft on the bay and offshore. And New York, New York is a chilly 37 degrees Fahrenheit 
and cloudy. And that is weather from around the world, brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources around the world. Associated Press brings us this first amuse bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays. Slovenian authorities have apprehended two alleged Russian spies suspected of using an agency dealing in real estate and antiques as our front for their activities in the NATO member. Slovenia's respected Delo newspaper and the CL News Portal cited the public prosecutor's office as confirming the arrest. Slovenian police confirmed that two individuals had been arrested in December for suspected espionage, but did not disclose which country they were accused of working for. Now, according to the media outlets... The two individuals were arrested on December 5th and remain in custody as the prosecutors continue their probe into espionage allegations. Police say they acted in cooperation with the Slovenian intelligence and security agency and based on directions from the Ljubljana District Prosecutor's Office. The suspect's detention prevented harmful consequences for the country's national security, its political, economic, and security interests, as well as international security, the spokesperson said. If found guilty, the suspects face in total up to eight years in prison. The report in Dello said the suspects had used a rented office in the capital, Ljubljana, as their base of operations. The suspects have also been active abroad, with one of the two holding Argentinian citizenship. The 24-hour news portal said the suspects were a married couple whose child went to school in Slovenia. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles Rester toujours fidèle C'est tout C'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps Mes étés de mer Mais autant quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire Je te donne tous mes hivers Alana Durkin Richer of the Associated Press brings us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. A wealthy Russian businessman and associates made tens of millions of dollars by cheating the stock market in an elaborate scheme that involved hacking into U.S. computer networks to steal insider information about companies such as Microsoft and Tesla, a prosecutor told jurors yesterday, Monday. Vladislav Kalushkin, uh, or Kalushin, the owner of a Moscow-based information technology company with ties to the upper levels of the Russian government, we know that means Vlad, is standing trial in a Boston federal court nearly two years after he was arrested after landing in Switzerland on a private jet for a skiing trip. He's the only Russian national charged in the nearly $90 million scheme who has been arrested and extradited to the U.S. Four accused co-conspirators, including a Russian military intelligence officer who's also been charged with meddling in the 2016 presidential election, 
remain at large. Assistant U.S. Attorney Stephen Frank told jurors that the hack to trade scheme netted uh, Klushin and his associates the kind of returns actual money managers could not even dream about. Using stolen information about the performance of a company that would dictate its stock price, Klushin personally turned a $2 million investment into nearly $21 million, and together the group turned about $9 million into nearly 90 million prosecutors said well that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day but you do know netroots radio broadcasts on and we will meet up here tomorrow for smothered benedict wednesdays so do stay tuned to netroots radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks and we will meet up here tomorrow right here in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appetit. Je voudrais du soleil vert Tell it Des photos de bord de mer De manche à d'un hiver Je voudrais de la lumière Comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre Je veux changer d'atmosphère De manche à d'un hiver Je voudrais du frais d'Aster Revoir un latte coël Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver